Uh, thank you, first of all, for your kind words, Sam, and thank you, Lynn, for having me here as well uh, today. Well, my name is Jazz Joe Hall, and I am a storyteller. The stories I've been fortunate to follow have provided me many lessons in life. I've been able to witness triumph and joy, and sadly, death and despair. A few months ago, I moved back to Canada after living overseas as Global Television's Asia Bureau Chief. I am proud to say I've been a resident of New Delhi and Beijing. It was a tremendous honor to work in two countries that are playing such a defining role this century and to see firsthand the economic and social changes that are taking shape in these old civilizations. As a foreign correspondent, I was able to witness and report on many history-making events. The Mumbai bombing showed how a thriving multi-ethnic democracy was brought to its knees as terrorists fueled by religious dogma killed innocent people. The assassination of Benazir Bhutto and the Talibanization of the region show that even 60 years after its creation, democracy is still not rooted in Pakistan. The Japanese tsunami showed the wrath of Mother Nature, but also the steely reserve of the Japanese people. In Lebanon and Israel, I covered the challenges of finding a lasting peace in the Middle East, as proxy groups representing Iran, Syria, and Saudi Arabia battle with each other for influence. I have covered tensions in the Korean Peninsula and the impact of the economic crisis in Europe. Last year, I spent much of my time covering the Arab Spring in Egypt and Libya. It was humbling to see uprisings fueled by decades of grievances, yet led in many ways by young people yearning for freedom. Both of those uprisings, and particularly in Egypt, also show the growing power of social media. Today, dictators see the internet and cell phones as threats to their power base like never before. I've also traveled to Afghanistan seven separate times covering Canada's war effort. It pains me to this day to see what has become of a once vibrant country. Today, the ravages of war can be seen everywhere. But it's not the damaged buildings and infrastructure that concern me most. After decades of war, the very psyche of the Afghan people, in my opinion, is damaged. Afghanistan, sadly, is a country still at war with itself. I've been around gunfire, bombings, and suicide bombers eight separate times in the last uh, five years or so, and I've had a few close calls. Covering Afghanistan or the war in Iraq is important, but sometimes what happens in these conflict zones attracts so much media attention, we forget much bigger forces that are changing the world. And that's the rise of Asia and the needs of three billion new potential capitals. It's not just the rise of China and India, but also the Indonesias and the Thailands as well. The hopes, dreams, fears, and consumption patterns that these three billion people represent are going to drive Canada's economy. They are the true game changers of the 21st century. When Bill Clinton became president of the United States, China represented 7% of the US economy. During George Bush's tenure, China represented 15%. When Barack Obama became president, China represented 35% of the U.S. economy. The Economist magazine is now predicting China will overtake America as early as 2018. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, we have lived in a world predominantly constructed by the West. Its institutions, economies, its culture have defined what it is to be modern. The 21st century is turning that simple but very important notion completely upside down. Modernism will no longer be Western. In fact, the West is going to be confronted with the fact that their systems aren't the only ones on offer. India and China aren't necessarily going to slide into a template for international behavior created by nations of the North Atlantic Basin. Throughout history, superpowers have tried to fashion the international system to meet their needs. India and China will be no different. Their very rise now challenges our Western-centric or even Eurocentric view of the world. Both are civilizations that will exert economic power and, yes, even military power. But their success in many ways also comes from soft power. That's their ability to exert ideas and philosophies as a culture. The United States does it very well. Its government funds the Voice of America radio station or the Fulbright scholarships. But American movies, McDonald's, its fashion industry, its sports franchises are also part of soft power. It's the ability to exert the American ideal. So the rise of China and India isn't just a question of economic and military muscle, but a reminder we are also seeing the rise of two ancient civilizations that have much to offer the world. And the world has certainly changed. Today, when an Englishman gets into his Jaguar, that's now an Indian company. Today, when an Englishman gets into his Land Rover, that's an Indian company. 
Today, when an Englishman drinks his Tetley tea, that's now an Indian company. Today, if you ask an Englishman what his country's national dish is, he'll most likely tell you it's Indian food. As Indian MP Shashi Thurur said, England's rise during the Industrial Revolution was its ability to extract resources and manufacture goods in an efficient manner. From coal mining, shipbuilding, and the iron and steel industry, it was a world leader. Today, in London, there are more people working in Indian restaurants than the coal mining, shipbuilding, and steel industry combined. So if anybody asks you, the empire does strike back. But here in Canada, we see and feel the rise of China as well. Ontario has lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs, most of those to China in the past decade. Since Confederation, Canada has been led by what John Ibbotson, the Global Mail's Ottawa bureau chief, calls the Laurentian Consensus. Essentially, it's the political, bureaucratic, business, media, and academic elite from central Canada that have generally done a decent job in building a strong, vibrant Canada. Today, that consensus is being challenged because of the rise of Western provinces, with China interested in our natural gas, our oil, our forests, and many other resources. Canada is forced to look towards Asia and not necessarily Europe. We see, the, we see that directly with two five billion dollar pipeline proposals from Enbridge and Kinder Morgan. And just yesterday, Royal Dutch Shell announced a twelve billion dollar LNG terminal that would transport natural gas to Asia from Kitimat. Greater trade brings greater financial clout, which brings political clout, which in the long term means Canada's center of gravity slowly shifts from east to west. That is the impact of China. There's no doubt both countries have tremendous challenges before it. In India, tens of millions of people are still mired in poverty. In China, economic reform has moved the country forward, but it must now find a way to implement political reforms that will give it a voice to its poorest of citizens and also allow dissenting opinions. We also know about human rights abuses as well. India and China's greatest test this century will be providing food and energy security for its people. Ultimately, no matter what the challenges, the rise of Asia is a force for good in this world. Already 400 million people have been taken out of poverty simply with the growth of China and India. The biggest poverty reduction program on this planet is called China and India. In closing, I want to leave you with a couple of anecdotes. It's why after all my years of reporting, I still remain an optimist, which in many ways is probably the greatest accomplishment for a reporter, because you see so much. I'm not just BC politics either. During my last few days in India, I had dinner with Vikram Sood. That's uh, him there you see on the screen. Mr. Sood is the former head of India's foreign spy agency. He retired in 2005. I had asked him to take the end of problems in Kashmir, where India and Pakistan have had a territorial dispute since 1947. In fact, to this day, it remains the highest altitude warfare in the world at 19,000 feet. He told me that if I'd asked him that same question 20 years ago, he would have given me a military type answer, how many troops are needed, how many fighter jets and tanks would be required. Today, his answer is completely different. If India, India continues its economic growth, three elements are required, he told me. Continued spending on healthcare, education, and infrastructure. If India continues in that direction, Pakistan, he says, becomes irre irrelevant to India in just 10 years. So no guns, no tanks, just healthcare, education, and infrastructure spending. Times have changed. Last August and September, I was dispatched to Libya, just as Tripoli fell to the rebels and Muammar Gaddafi fled the capital. We managed to get into Libya via Tunisia. I was in Tunisia where Mohammed Bouazizi, a 26-year-old fruit vendor, set himself on fire in protest because of the way he was treated by local authorities. It convinced his countrymen to rise up against the government. It was that moment when the Arab Spring began, eventually spreading to Egypt and Libya. In Tripoli, I managed to get into Muammar Gaddafi's compound. We had filmed there for a few hours, and as we were leaving, I paused for a moment to take in what I had just witnessed. And many times, you're so busy in your job, you don't do that. When you're around these situations that are history-making, you forget that, you know, take a moment and take a mental snapshot. And that day, I did. And I mean, I've been watching Mr. Gaddafi, as all of you had since the 80s, and the, the, his altercations and, and incidents with the US government and all those types of things. So, as I was looking around, I did pause from them going, man, a kid from Williams Lake, what the heck am I doing at Momar's house? I had to admit that, you know? And uh, 
And I, I, and I, I was just uh, saying, you know what? You gotta, you gotta remember this moment. And it was difficult, it was hard for me even today to imagine that a dictator that ran Libya for decades was forced to flee because of the actions of a fruit vendor months earlier. And I said, you gotta remember this place. So, you know, I took out my pocket knife, I looked around, and I brought this with me, and I, I well, I stole this, quite frankly. <laughs> Don't tell mom. And I cut off a piece of his chandelier. So this is Muammar Gaddafi's chandelier. I keep it in my home office to remind myself nothing lasts forever, whether it's Western economic domination or a dictator's hold on power. It's a reminder that today, with the internet, Facebook, and Twitter, the world is a much smaller place, and global events can change at the click of a mouse. Muammar Gaddafi learned that the hard way. Thank you.